much for that uh, very nice uh, introduction. Um, and uh, what I love about it is uh, your enthusiasm for everything. Um, it seems to be boundless. It was in October and it doesn't seem to have been diminished. So, um, you know, keep it up. So, OK, without further ado, I will share my screen and uh, begin this uh, presentation, which I hope is timed to about the 20 minutes. Uh, share. OK, so. Just one sec there now. Is that visible? Yeah. One sec there now. No, just... Okay. Okay. So good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Um, I realise that um, I'm competing with Michal Martin and his state of the, uh, we'll say, state of the nation address in respect to extending uh, level five restrictions and hopefully kind of giving a pathway, um, as government sees it at least, um, uh, for the next couple of months in our journey with this uh, viral infection. Um, I suppose it's interesting to note that pre-COVID that virology and immunology is two disciplines in Ireland, uh, while important, certainly we're not, uh, you know, we'll say as globally aware um, and certainly nationally aware and, you know, in the lexicon of the country we now have uh, R rates, we have genomes, we have mutations, we have variants, we have immunology, we have antibodies and stuff that would have been kind of off the airwaves and certainly not um, in kind of ordinary discourse uh, amongst the public on a day-to-day -day basis. So, um, I'm based in the Department of Medicine, just a little bit of background, I'm based in the Department of Medicine. Uh, my, my two areas of research are immunology and virology, really host virus, particularly engagement, and that extends from eukaryotic engagement with viruses such as hepatitis C and HIV and hepatitis B, as Adina said, but also laterally into looking at the immune biome and the engagement of our immune system with uh, bacteriophage and bacteria and how that informs uh, evolution of the microbiome and perhaps the a seeding of the microbiome in early life. Okay, so the title of my talk today is So You've Been Vaccinated Against COVID-19, So What is Next? And that punctuation and that so what is deliberate and it'll become evident as I go, go through my talk. So uh, hopefully by the end of it, you'll have some sense of the immunology uh, upon uh, acquiring natural infection with COVID-19. Some of the correlates associated with uh, vaccination and what we can use to determine what is a successful vaccine and vaccine strategy um, and where we might go with that strategy and the information we're getting on effectiveness with respect to preventing transmission and preventing infection. But what I'd like to lead off on is a kind of a, a pictogram or, uh, of as how I see uh, COVID-19 and its impact on us globally and how it prefaces what I'm going to say. So kind of just leading off from the top left we're obviously in an era where we have COVID vaccines. We have three approved uh, in, in Europe um, and the J&J &J one currently under consideration by the European Medicines Association. We have unfortunately become used to social distancing and this lack of absence of touch and lack of absence of, of nearly community amongst individuals and friends. However, you could say one of the upsides of it uh, was that uh, some of the, you know, the wildlife that lives near us or within our environs actually reclaimed some of the land that was once theirs um, and started moving into our cities. But perhaps one of the most poignant um, pictures that um, I think summarizes COVID-19 is this picture of two old individuals, a couple married for 60 years, um, and they ended up dying separately in separate places because of COVID. Um, and I think one of the big things that we've learned from COVID is language is very important. And at the beginning of the pandemic, the language was very negative, very, uh, very oppressive, almost implying, you know, a threat of criminal sanction should one leave one's home if you were elderly. And in some sense, and certainly in the spirit, it contravened the, the you know, the Convention on Human Rights with respect to dignity and respect to uh, one's freedom of movement. And I think that's something that's going to be, unfortunately, a very negative legacy with respect to the way Ireland handled the pandemic. Coronavirus reached Antarctica. And uh, a very sad point was reached on the 24th of May. The New York Times published three pages of, of names, 100,000 in total, of individuals who had died with COVID-19. And I think center here to my pictogram is the human toll. And I think the human toll is going to continue and go on for many a year, not just when vaccines have done their job. Um, in the mid left-hand side here, I have a picture taken from John Hopkins uh, Coronavirus Resource Center. And today you can see that there are over 111 million persons infected. And a re key and salient point will be reached in the next day or two. Uh, you can't really see it, but just below the 2.5 million individuals who've died of COVID, the United States of America, 
will pass a point where more people have died of coronavirus or with coronavirus infection than died, uh, than American troops died in World War I and World War II put together. Um, I think that's a very uh, salient point, very sad point that we've reached in this pandemic that, you know, this is a virus that actually, you know, obviously it pays no heed to the development status of a country, but even in very, you know, modern state of the art societies with a, a reasonably well developed society that, um, you know, this virus is having an enormous impact. Bottom left, we don't understand yet the anatomy of this outbreak, we don't understand the evolutionary uh, genesis of uh, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. Um, we have many questions uh, to ask. The WHO is investigating it. And as we know, geopolitics and, and politics is kind of, you know, intersecting with virology and human care and human health and human rights and all that kind of stuff. So um, I think it will be a long time yet before we have an understanding of the anatomy of this outbreak. We've all become aware of PPE. We wear masks now and actually, you know, CDC is coming out and saying we should be wearing two masks, two different cloth types or, you know, a, a kind of a surgical mask and a cloth type over it. We've, we understand the kind of uh, morbidity um, that is associated with COVID-19 infection. And it's not just a respiratory infection, it affects the clotting systems. We have a kind of a cerebral fog. We have all sorts of neuralgias um, appearing in individuals living with long COVID. We've even seen some data that it affects male fertility. Um, and, uh, you know, perhaps maybe using some of the data on the disease, the, the systems that are affected by COVID-19 might impact um, public awareness and public, I will say, adherence to some of the, the public health guidelines. Surprisingly, some of the positives that have come out of it is that CDC demonstrated that COVID-19 wiped out flu around the world this year. Um, we've had very little flu, the, the ordinary respiratory, apart just from influenza A and B, RSV, human metamorphosis, adenovirus, they've all been way down on the kind of list of infections that have been presented to GPs. So where does Ireland stand with respect to its vaccination? Um, as of the 19th of February, so that's the most recent date, Ireland had 2.6% of its population fully vaccinated. Rather poor when you compare it to countries like Israel, which is over 35.5% uh, of its population, the United States 5.8%. And it's ironic that the United States is 5.8% of its population vaccinated, considering it has over a half a million individuals who have died with, uh, with SARS-CoV-2. Um, and what you'll see down here towards the end is the United Kingdom was only 0.9% of its population vaccinated. Um, but we, the United Kingdom made a decision with respect to the, co, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine, even though the trials were done with a number of weeks apart, they've stretched that to actually three months apart. Um, and I suppose in the fullness of time, it will be seen to have probably been a good decision, but it does raise some flags with respect to you know, moving outside of the leg the licensing of particular vaccines and even medicines, and when can governments decide that it's a good idea to you know to, to move outside the, um, the the strictures with which these medicines are approved? There are a number of different types of vaccine delivery mechanisms. Some we've become used to. In the bottom left here, we have the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, or mRNA vaccines bu bundled with nanoparticles. Um, which then produce this spike protein that we've become familiar with. Um, we have, uh, there are DNA uh, vaccines, but none of them approved in human use. We have inactivated vaccines such as polio. We've live attenuated, um, such as the measles, mumps and rubella that we all get as children or that most individuals get as children. We have subunit vaccines, the hepatitis B one, an extraordinarily successful vaccine at reducing the incidence of acute hepatitis B. We have human papilloma viruses and virus like particles and AstraZeneca, we have the virus vector um, particles for the, the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. So we have a, a, an array of delivery mechanisms for given vaccines. So I, I expect that this uh, landscape will explode with respect to its diversity of vaccines um, methods that are uh, available and also the types of vaccines for poliovirus and rabies and so on that are available for future use. As most vaccines require two shots at the moment, um, the Pfizer, the uh, AstraZeneca and the Moderna vaccines require two shots, although as we appreciate the uh, British government has made a decision to extend the, the, the time frame between shots for the um, Oxford um, uh, vaccine and the second shot a few weeks later we give most individuals their best protection. J&J &J is currently under consideration by the European Medicines Association, and that is a one-shot vaccine, and hopefully that will be approved mid-March and will lead to some acceleration of the percentage of the population that are, in, that are um, protected. 
So how do COVID-19 vaccines work? Well, in essence, they safely mimic a part of the infection and generate varying levels of protection depending on the type, modality of administration of the vaccine, and of course the protein or proteins that are involved. Just to, uh, you know, it would be remiss of me not to have a picture as a, a virologist of a genome. Uh, its size is 30 KB, which is rather large for RNA viruses. It's a single stranded positive sense, which means it can be directly translated into protein. And like most other viruses, it has uh, proteins that are called structural and or they actually form the structure of the virus particle, which we can see in the EM of here on the left hand side, we can see this kind of rounded structure with pitted uh, darker electron dense proteins, this kind of corona uh, on the outside that's hence it's called coronavirus because it looks like a crown. Um, and we have non structural proteins which are important for replication for down regulating our response to the virus for chopping up various bits of proteins. Um, and in total there are 29 pro proteins produced from this single RNA genome. So the whole idea of vaccination and using antigens to generate immunity is one in this context to try and reduce serious disease and by serious disease we mean admission to hospital needy, needing either extracorporeal support or uh, needing steroid support or any other kind of pharmaceutical interventions that we can have the limited that ones that we do to reduce transmission to prevent transmission and maybe ideally have sterilizing immunity, which is the kind of, you know, the, uh, the kind of really, you know, high target for, for vaccine is to produce li a lifelong sterilizing immunity. And I suppose as in life, memory is key to the success of vaccination. So just to give you a kind of a, a immunology 101 and how we establish memory, immunity as a concept uh, is really uh, driven by two, we have two arms uh, as most simplistic, the adaptive, in other words, we adapt to infections, or the innate, which is our frontline exposure, kind of generic immune system to uh, molecules that have certain patterns. Um, and without this innate immunity, uh, we would be, you know, really spanceled with respect to kind of how we deal with infections. In fact, some infections are actually cleared by our innate immune system without kicking in the adaptive immune system. And individuals who are agamma globulinemic depend largely on their innate immune system. And we have huge evidence of that from hepatitis C. The adaptive, well, we'll divide it into natural and artificial. Let me deal with natural. Natural would be natural infection, influenza A, um, which would be called active infection, but we get passive immunity as well. True immunoglobulins in the case of humans pass through the placenta into the growing uh, fetus in the third trimester or through colostrum as well as another source. Um, of antibodies is not just a nutritional source, it's an immunoglobulin or it's an immune support, um, um, fantastic um, product that is produced by mammals. Active infection, you're exposed, we react to it, and hopefully one establishes memory. I get to that in a minute. But viruses and pathogens have adapted and have and, and uh, produced proteins or other molecules which downregulate um, our response to infection because obviously pathogens are selfish genomes and they want to perpetuate themselves, sometimes by killing the host and other times by not. Artificial, well, we have active immunization um, through the use of vaccines um, and we have passive, much like in the context of uh, maternal, but we have passive immunoglobulin uh, transfer in the case of maybe hepatitis B, mother is hepatitis B chronically infected, infant is born, infant is vaccinated, and infant is also given a support of immunoglobulins against the hepatitis B um, surface proteins. And with active immunization, we establish memory again in the artificial um, uh, system. And no, with passive immunity, we do not establish memory. It's a kind of a temporal protection against, or at least an attempt to try and ameliorate the consequences of sequelae of infection. This slide here, just kind of in summary, let me deal with this, the, the information on the right hand side. So really what happens in acute resolving infection, and it also applies to vaccination, is there are six tenets. We identify the foreign molecules or proteins. They're presented to the immune system in a manner that can be recognized. We produce molecules that attack these foreign proteins and infected cells. We begin the process of elimination. We establish memory and we use this memory to uh, fight off secondary infections. And even in the context of chronic infections, we still go through processes one to four. We still establish memory, but the, if you like, the equilibrium between clearance and persistence is, is swung in favor of chronic infections such as hepatitis B, such as HIV, and such as um, um, hepatitis C. On the left-hand side here, I have a kind of a schematic. I won't go through it in great detail, but it's really what happens in a natural infection with coronavirus. 
spike protein on the outside of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, gives it this crown-like crown appearance on EM, enters into a receptor called the ACE2 receptor and through a process of proteolytic cleavage, ends up coming into the cell. Um, the RNA fuses with vesicles and the RNA, which is the genetic material of the virus, is extruded into the cytoplasm. All the proteins that are needed to translate the RNA into protein are already there. Um, and uh, then through a process of assembly are released from the cell. Um, and this is where part of the engagement with the immune system kicks in. We have these antigen presenting cells, which to cut a long story short, present it in a, in a manner, you know, that can be basically seen by the checkout. It's imagined like it's like a barcode, you go to the checkout and it's wandered into the immune system. We see it and it responds in either B cells, T cells and other NK cells and other types of things. And the bottom line is we produce molecules called antibodies or we produce a cellular response. I'm not going to go into the cellular response today. Everybody's talking about antibodies, you know, seroconversion and these antibodies latch onto the virus. They're labeled for destruction. And that's basically what happens. Vaccine is something similar. We get with the RNA, RNA vaccines here, top left, and these lipoparticles, these nanoparticles are injected into the muscle in the arm. They're taken up by cells. We produce these proteins. And the, the cells that react to them go into the lymphatic system and they migrate into the drain, uh, the vaccine draining lymph nodes. So under your arm, they can, you know, some people might get a swelling post vaccination. They're presented in a context that's recognized. So that's MHC class one, MHC class two. And we have T cells and B cells. We have all sorts of a range of cells in the germinal center of the lymph node. And basically, you through a process of cytokines and the right environment, we get antibodies produced. We get memory cells that remember what that antibody responded to. And we get cytotoxic T cells, which remember what antigen they responded to. And between the two of them, we mop up free virus and we mop up those cells that have been infected. Is this any good to us? Well, as you know, OK, SARS-CoV-2 was really only came onto the landscape in December 2019, but actually probably was present for a couple of months beforehand. Um, and so we are beginning to see peer review publications coming out on immunological memory associated with SARS-CoV-2 infection. And we have a very short window. We've only eight months. This really isn't long-term memory. We've only got a really an understanding of the short-term memory um, with respect to SARS-CoV-2. And let me take you through this rather detailed slide, starting on the left-hand side, and I'll work my way to the right-hand side. So this particular paper by Jennifer Dan, a rather excellent paper, looked at four particular components of the immune system. The memory B cells, these are the, these are the memory cells that produce antibodies on re-challenge um, to an infection or re-challenge with a vaccine. We have the active molecules, the molecules that actually do the targeting. So these, these, are divide, these antibodies are divided into classes. I have three shown here, IgM, IgG, and IgA. And they, they latch onto maybe the receptor binding domain, RBD, of the spike protein block its access to the cellular receptor, so stop it getting in, and also react to other pr proteins produced by the virus so that when they appear upon an infection, we can react to them and eliminate those proteins and those cells. We have two particular types of T cells. I won't go into the details of how they differ, but they react to and challenge cells that are infected with this virus and have these proteins that the virus produce presented on in the proper context in the cell or on the surface of the cell, and there we react and we destroy them. So this paper looked at five correlates and they had a lovely scoring system for it. The five correlates associated with memory, G for the receptor binding domain IgG, B for the receptor binding domain memory cells that produce these antibodies on rechallenge, four and eight, so they uh, were these specific CD4 cells, and IgA, which is really important. It's the mucosal immune clearance system. So in your saliva, in your gut, we produce tons of IgA a day and these will latch onto it. So remember, you know, SARS-CoV-2 is, is like a, it infects a mucosal accessible tissue um, as opposed to kind of, we'll say, an inner organ through the peripheral blood system. And I'll go to the six month data more so than the other data. And really, so they scored each of these correlates of immunity with a one. Um, and those individuals in black had five out of five markers associated with memory uh, six months post exposure to SARS-CoV-2 um, and the red had four and so on. And what you really see is out of 188 individuals, a fabulously powered study, 90% of individuals had three or more markers associated with memory to SARS-CoV-2. And what does this mean? It means that despite the heterogeneity of the immune response to this SARS-CoV-2, we 
generate a robust immune system, immune reactivity against this virus. And it's, it's kind of positively disposed to kind of memory and why perhaps we may have some consideration to those that were infected, maybe delaying getting their first vaccine shot. And I'll deal with that later. So the study conclusion was substantial immune me memory is generated after COVID-19 infection involving all four major types of immune memory. And But the key thing here is circulating antibody titers are not predictive of T-cell memory. And you need both T-cell and B-cell uh, armory um, to help effectively remove this infection. And we've seen from some individuals who are um, uh, immunocompromised and that are repeatedly treated with antibodies, kind of a passive attempt to try and clear the infection, um, that you have this on again, off again break. And what we've found with this methodology of trying to manage COVID-19 in immunocompromised individuals, that it's a perfect breeding ground and all virologists would know, this is a beautiful breeding ground for, 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 for mutants. Um, and we'll say vaccine or treatment escape mutants. In this case, it would be antibody escape mutants. But another very important finding from this study is that simple serological tests for SARS-CoV-2 antibodies do not reflect the richness and durability of immune memory. And uh, anyone who's involved in the biomedical sciences or you know, clinical medicine will understand that serology is the cornerstone of assessment of exposure to infection. Um, and this really challenges the value of serology in some aspects when managing this infection. There is some good news. Dare I say it, we have some good news in COVID-19. It's nice to get it. Israel, of course, is leading the way. Um, and on the, uh, the 15th of February, they seem to release their results on Sundays. Um, data collected by one of their major health insurance agencies, uh, a really well-powered study where they had 523,000 vaccinated individuals are vaccinating their older population first. So the, there's an age discrepancy between the two data sets that I'll give you. But out of that large number, only 544 had RNA detectable on swab. That, that, that accounts, you know, only 0.1% became infected post-vaccination. This is extraordinary data. Only 15 out of that over half a million were hospitalized and only four required kit critical care and none died. Um, so really you can see the percent percentage hospitalized requiring critical care out of the vaccinated was 0 0.0008, tiny. Um, and of those that were infected and, and hospitalized out of those 50, you know, only out of those infected, this 544 figure, only four became Hospital, so really small. Compare that to the unvaccinated. I've only given you some of the data. Nearly 18 and a half thousand for similarly powered number became infected. The vaccine provides 28 percent, 28 fold protection from infection. Now there are age groups between them, and most of the unvaccinated were uh, younger. But nonetheless, this is very powerful data for the protection that the vaccine provides. Key question in everybody's lips these days is. Oh, I'm worried about the variants, the UK variant, the South African variant, the Brazilian variant. And this is a normal phenomenon in virology. Viruses don't purposefully adapt. They generate mutations randomly. And if they survive a selection pressure, it outcompetes those that can't, and therefore it begins, it, it, it dominates the population. And if that individual can pass on the infection, well, then it may, may dominate and that individual. And then that's how you get it replacing and a dominant strain with another strain. And what the, the data here in two circles, B and D, are just like, this is a lovely study, again, using the Moderna vaccine this time. And they harvested blood from phase one trials collected at day 36, um, seven days after the second dose of the vaccine. And what they found was that even though the variant hadn't evolved at the time of the study, the Moderna vaccine was able to neutralize uh, in an in vitro model um, uh, a model that had uh, the spike protein from the UK variant. And again, they challenged that with the South African spike protein. And what they found was that there was a reduction of 6.4 fold activity against, this, against the South African variant. That doesn't mean there wasn't any, it just means it was less. And it doesn't mean that it wouldn't assist the individual who's infected with the South African variant. It just means it wasn't the same as the wild type. Again, some more news, good news. Some trial results are also offer clues that vaccination might reduce, prevent infection. Two results, again, the Moderna noticed a two third drop in the number of asymptomatic uh, infections amongst individuals who received the first shot of the two dose vaccine. The caveat here, of course, people were only tested twice and it was one month apart and they may have missed some infections, but it wouldn't take away from the fact that a large number, uh, it was a large drop in the number of asymptomatic infections. 
the AstraZeneca vaccine, again, something similar, nearly a 50% reduction in asymptomatic infections measured by RNA. And here's a, a point that I try to emphasize when talking to colleagues um, is why natural infection and immunity to natural infection is different to the immunity that we get when we have when we are vaccinated. These viruses produce proteins which downregulate our capacity to respond to the virus. In this particular case, I've shown some proteins, uh, TBK1 um, and uh, ORF6 uh, and NS uh, non-structural protein 13, which downregulate Rig I. IRF7, IRF3 prevent us producing enough interferon alpha, enough interferon beta, establishing our immune potency and our immune memory. Um, but with a vaccine, you've only one protein and it doesn't have those inhibitory effects. So therefore, uh, trying to draw straight line correlates between natural infection and immunity therein versus in vaccine infection uh, and immunity, sorry, vaccine exposure and immunity. Um, you can't draw a straight line between the, uh, the, the, car the immune correlates. There's clinical trials ongoing at the moment where they're directly looking at that and asking the question, what are the immu immune correlates associated with natural infection what, uh, and immunity? And what are the uh, correlates associated with response to this vaccine, both T cell and B cell? And of course we have the evolution of uh, strains with the uh, Manana strain in, in Brazil. We have these unique sp uh, spike proteins and questions about why in a population that apparently had reached herd immunity, and I use that term herd immunity with caution in respect to natural infections in populations. It's really only a term that should be associated with vaccines, but I get the concept that people are trying to, to understand is that enough of people had been infected so that infection shouldn't be able to pass from individual to individual. And yet we see a kind of a second outbreak. There are several uh, rational explanations which may explain that, I can't go into here. And of course we have potential immune escape variants, which our antibodies may not recognize, but remember we have our T cell and innate immunity. And of course, this gives us guidance that there's a future role for polyvalent vaccines. In other words, not just the spike protein, but have the N protein the, and the M protein as part of the vaccines. So we're preloaded with not just one, a bit like drug therapy, monotherapy is effective, but polyvalent therapy or, or, you know, or multi-drug therapy is much more effective. COVID vaccine program in Ireland. There was a strategy, a, a fine document produced, but what was its objective? In the first instance, to reduce mortality and morbidity as a consequence of COVID-19 infection. And we've seen from the Israeli data, we've seen from the clinical trial data that this can be achieved. They want to have our communities reconnect in ways we used to take for granted. Now, I suppose on a personal level, I take exception to we take for granted. Um, it's rather pejorative, rather patronizing language. It was the way we lived. Uh, we, you know, we have had pandemics in the past, none of them were particularly challenging, the 2009 influenza pandemic, the current uh, epidemics running around with mirrors and SARS-CoV-1 that we had a really close escape with um, in 2003. And of course, then part of the program is for our economy to resume positive growth uh, trajectory. And I have a diagram here in the bottom right with regard to vaccination and vaccinating Ireland and why it's so key that we get as much vaccine out there as possible. But if I don't get the vaccine, what are the implications for my life and in Ireland and the, and the world? And we've already seen, you know, the, vac the, the Vatican has put out a, a kind of a, a message, no jab, no job. Will I be able to travel? Well, currently, if you can get to Iceland and you are vaccinated, you won't have to go into quarantine and you won't have to uh, have a test. You just produce your vaccine uh, documentation. What does this mean for us in Ireland? Well, if you're vaccinated and at level five, you're still going to be stuck with the 5K AM restrictions, depending on what Michal Martin says at the moment, I suspect it'll be April before we're released. Um, we'll have no free assembly if you're vaccinated. You still have to homeschool the kids. Uh, it'll be a negative impact on mental health and individuals and families. We have massive lost life experience with our youth and uh, you know, with respect to them not being on the vaccine list, at least they're way down at level 14. I'll discuss that in a minute. No visits to long-term long care facilities, even if the relative is vaccinated and the elder, older person is vaccinated, there's still no guidance, no allowance for those individuals to visit, even acknowledging all the good Israeli data and the vaccine trial data. We need a concept of vaccine pods. We need to release the vaccinated, at least have a discussion on it, evidence-based. We need to live despite the virus, not with the virus. We need to just, you know, we need to have a coherent evidence-based strategy as to perhaps some groups can be, you know, allowed to mix, maybe the vaccinated when it, the, the, you know, the, the, the numbers per 100,000, do we allow the schools go back in that county? Like Cork has less than 100,000, 
sorry, less than 100 per 100,000. Cork and Kerry, the two leaders in the country as of yesterday. I don't know what the figures are for today. So COVID-19 vaccine vaccinated in Ireland. What is next? So that depends on the time frame and your perspective. And this is really, I suppose, one of my key slides is the immediate and short term, mid term and long term effects. The immunological ones, well, that's standard immunology, 10 to 14 days and an efficacious vaccine, you'll have high levels of immunity. Societal level, there'll be reduced nosocomial infection and other first level vaccine groups will have less infection amongst them. On the individual level, extreme restrictions to personal freedoms will still be enforced, unfortunately, even if you are vaccinated. And the socioeconomic effects, well, state aid will still be required. And, you know, it's going to cost billions. I think the cost so far is 9.4 billion. Uh, Midterm effects, the over 70s vaccinated, well, you know, there'll be ongoing increase in immunity in that population, but caveats might apply to new isolates, but we might not have them in the country if we close the airports, close the ports, maybe seal the border on a societal level, reduce hospitalizations, reduce transmission on an individual level, we'll probably have marginal, redu marginal reductions in severe restrictions and personal freedoms are likely. Uh, and this is in the context of a very effective vaccine where we could have up to maybe half a million or even three quarters of a million people um, vaccinated, the most vulnerable. And remember, at the outset, the, one of the, the key things was to first was to reduce mortality and morbidity. And I think that needs to come into the conversation about the value of vaccines and how we release society and get back to living, not as we uh, took for granted, but as we used to live. And on a socioeconomic level, it's slightly more essential worker categories will be allowed to work. The long-term effects, immunologically, possibly further reduction in transmissions on a population level, and we may need boosters and variant vaccines specific to particular variants may be rolled out. But will it be enough? Again, I posit that it would depend on your optics, on the optics, maybe the political optics, the business optics, and your perspective. And we're in the realm of Rumsfeldian unknown unknowns. Um, uh, and I really think it's some of it's crystal ball gazing stuff, but some of it, it can be evidence-based. So discussion points, lessons and future directions. So what evidence supports implementing of restrictions, easing of restrictions, the ethics of that, the constitutionality and the civil rights? Remember the kind of, you know, uh, taking away of the, you know, or at least the, the language used was very aggressive and very authoritarian with respect to the elderly at the beginning of, of the pandemic. Their autonomy was more or less kind of verbally taken away. How do we approach the vaccinated versus the vaccinated? Those that don't want to be vaccinated, how can we get an education program to them? What restrictions will be on their day-to-day -day living? And the age profile of the vaccine, we need to have a discussion perhaps looking at the data. The, most, uh, the group that are most infected at the moment are those somewhat less than 35. So you know, perhaps I would posit we need a discussion around once we have this over 70s and over 65s vaccinated and those with chronic conditions, vaccinate the 16 to 35 year, year olds. You know, they have sacrificed an awful lot. They have been asked, in fact, they've been told they haven't had much choice in giving up their personal freedoms, relationships, mental health development, life experiences. Future vaccine developments, we will have second generation vaccines by the end of the year. We can mix types, perhaps, AstraZeneca with Pfizer. We can buy perhaps the excess vaccines as some other countries have done. I know we've worn the European card well, but maybe we need to consider buying vaccines that might go with COVAX and kind of providing, you know, vaccines for third party countries or third world countries when, you know, we've reached a certain thing. But, you know, I think it needs to be discussed, however uncomfortable that discussion might be. We'll have polyvalent ones to other proteins and mucosal immunity is going to be another thing that's going to be important for all respiratory vaccines. And I think what we'll see in time is that these mRNA vaccines will be very agile, very adaptable, um, you know, probably deserving of a Nobel Prize at some point. The lessons for Ireland Incorporated, the need for real-time sequencing, not this business of 2 and 3%. We need many more percent sequencing. We need implementation of evidence-based actionable disease control measures, evidence-based. And we need a communication strategy that takes account of people's ability to understand messages, the various groups. We need the behavioral scientists involved. And we need, uh, you know, we need research, research, research is key. It has answered these questions. We wouldn't have these vaccines without research. And we need to pre-secure ethics on a national level so that if a pandemic comes around again, where, where we can hit the ground running, not that we're waiting three and four months to go through the appropriate ethical hoops that are in, you know, there to protect individuals with respect to their data, their samples. But we need to have a nationally secure ethical framework where we can respond immediately. We need category three labs. We need all this kind of stuff. We need an urgent investment, I posit, around 100 million per annum in pandemic preparedness in Ireland. And this is in the totality of both the infrastructure to sequence cloud-based stuff, um, you know, implementate medical strategies, public health and all that. 
and we urgently need parallel mitigation and existential catast uh, catastrophe planning for the pandemic that will kill maybe 20 to 40 percent of individuals in the 16 to 35 age group with long-term disabling morbidity in 50 percent of the recovered and bear in mind that COVID-19 is not the big one this is not a big pandemic by any means so I suppose I'll finish where I started with my second slide and just, just pictogram. And the last thing I'll say is this, this on the right hand side corner of this, the, the mass graves that we had. Um, and this is a kind of an image taken, I think if memory serves me right from South America and the mass graves with regard to COVID-19 and how by not being prepared um, and uh, we, we were vulnerable, we missed out on the lessons of 2009 on SARS-CoV-1. Uh, we've got, you know, we got a couple of get out of jail cards, but we didn't cash them in and we didn't put in the infrastructure and we didn't put in a, a coherent population education as to what to do. Uh, you know, our time has come. We have to learn the lessons. The universities and the hospitals and the opinion leaders need to drive um, a, an agenda and not be shy about asking for money, which is, you know, can be invested and it can be used for other things before the pandemic arrives, but upskilling, getting people uh, ready, getting the universities, you know, to have the ethicists, to have the category three labs, maybe even a category four lab, um, and not be shy of taking risk when it comes to investigating these pathogens, because it will come around again to haunt us. We're invading nature at an awful rate and nature is going to bite back. I don't mean that in a literal sense, um, but you know, I think, I think we need to, um, think and the learning lessons have to be large, quick and actionable. I'll end there, Adina. That was a wonderful presentation, Liam. Thank you so much. Questions? I'd love to pass on to Dr. Oshin O'Connell, if he's happy to present. Uh, thanks very much, Adina, and a fantastic talk, Liam. Uh, I know we were competing with Micheál Martin, but um, uh, I saw Adina had already texted him earlier on about this thing, so he may actually join because he has got the Zoom link and I'll explain that in a second. Uh, so I didn't really have a name for my talk and I was thinking that if I was to call it anything, I would call it uh, Fibonacci series fractals and bell curves and uh, talk about the mathematics of Ireland's response to COVID and how it came about. And uh, I'll try and explain that as the kind of talk goes on. So I don't really have a unifying theme for the talk, but it's just the wandering thoughts through uh, COVID in Ireland's response and lessons I've learned in the last year myself. My own background, I'm a respiratory consultant. I did a doctoral research thesis in innate immunity to respiratory pathogens. I, I was doing my MD thesis directly above Liam's wonderful office there. Um, and I did a subspecialty fellowship training in lung transplantation. Um, and I suppose the reason Adina asked me to talk uh, today is that uh, I probably was one of the people that recognized early the timings and the effects COVID was going to have on Ireland and the timings for a lockdown. So in Cork, we actually had the second uh, community acquired case. We had the first and the second community acquired COVID cases in Ireland. But I suppose we were looking after this, one of those patients and uh, I recognized that the time courses that that patient had been in hospital, the time courses that public health had declined to test the patient um, made me very concerned that the virus had to have been in the country for over a month. So that was on the 5th of March uh, last year. And uh, that prompted me to directly contact the Minister for Health and actually the current Taoiseach of the day of today to explain that I thought we needed uh, immediate population restrictions. Um, it became clear to me that that wasn't really on the agenda and actually I went on to kind of set up a WhatsApp group where I got about 150 medics across kind of infectious disease, um, across uh, ICU society, across the Irish Thoracic Society. And I ended up getting about um, 30 journalists, 150 medics, and a huge bunch of interesting people with a specialist interest in COVID across. Uh, we had people from the WHO, we had people from UNICEF. Um, and one of the guys, uh, interesting enough, was a guy called Paul O'Brien, who had gone to med school in China. So that week between the 5th uh, of March, uh, I actually let, uh, Adina mentioned, you know, everyone in Ireland seems to know everyone else, and that is very true. So what I did with the first 50 people in the WhatsApp group is I made them all admins and they couldn't 
add interesting people to the group and the group became fascinating fairly quickly. So we had Dr. Adina Milne, who did her PhD on the 1918 pandemic, was added in. Um, Dr. Tomas Puyo, who I'll talk about later, Professor Didier Cernesh, um, so two kind of former TED Talk uh, people were added in. But um, in the end, we ended up coordinating a conference with both Lombardy and China that week. And actually, the Chinese national experts gave us a talk and we got representatives from uh, each of the universities. So Professor John O'Halloran represented UCC, Professor Mary Horgan from the RCPI, and then we represented us from each of the uh, universities in Ireland. And we also had Oxford University Centre representative. And the conference was held in the bonds and the Wuhan experts uh, actually gave us a talk on how to manage COVID. They actually gave us a 180 page uh, English translated handbook of everything to do. Uh, and we actually shared that through the Royal College of Physicians at the time. So the Chinese actually had a, an incredible detail as to how COVID should be managed. They were talking about the hospital infrastructures, they were talking about public health, they were talking about the use of steroids and tocilizumab, which is an anti-IL-6 uh, repurposed uh, medication for uh, rheumatoid. Similarly, we held a separate conference call with uh, Lombardy, and it was actually quite a surreal conference call that we held with Lombardy because we were speaking to an intensive care doctor and he, one kind of word that was quite striking or phrase that was quite striking was um, he mentioned that he said, we're probably never going to meet. You're facing this front. You're inquiring as to what it's like. And he says, nothing will prepare you. I feel like I'm in a World War II movie. Uh, and it really struck me at the time. I mean, being honest, Ireland never ended up facing that because we were about five weeks ahead of Italy. But what concerned me and what concerned my reflection on what the Irish response was, was Italy had a doubling time of three days where between the first case and about their 7,000th uh, case, that the uh, cases had been doubling every three days. Now, at the time, there was a bit of controversy as to whether pre-symptomatic spread occurred, but it's impossible to have a latency of five days between infection and exposure and for there not to be asymptomatic spread. So the Chinese had said the same, and in, in the end, actually, RTE actually did a little telecast uh, with Professor Hogan, Paula Brown, and myself, uh, where the Chinese gave us all this information. But I suppose that kind of led me to, um, I suppose, where I think our WhatsApp group might have been quite influential because there was a number of key players in the WhatsApp group, Professor Paddy Mallon, uh, Dr. Tony, um, Tom Ryan and the ID Society all kind of put out a statement suggesting that there was a delay and a hesitancy in Ireland in terms of its initial population restrictions and that the measures that had been implemented in Italy needed to be implemented. So I think there was discussions going on the 10th and the 11th and then uh, kind of I think that helped prompt some of the HSE people in the group to uh, reflect and move towards an earlier population restrictions on March 12th, probably not to the level that we'd been proposing uh, in the group. Um, so um, I, I suppose uh, getting back to why I kind of talk, talked about the talk today being called the Fibonacci series, fractals and bell curves. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what is the Fibonacci series, what are fractals and what's the relevance of bell curves and some of the own lessons that I've learned. So the Fibonacci series is where you start with the number zero and one, you add them and you keep adding the previous two digits. And this is what's called the Fibonacci series. And you'll learn that the Fibonacci series and fractals occur everywhere in nature. So if you've ever heard of Leonardo DiCaprio's Vitruvian Man, it's regarded as the perfectly aesthetic human. And the ratio of the golden number is throughout the Vitruvian Man. The further up in the Fibonacci, the Fibonacci series you go, the closer you get to the golden number ratio. And the golden number ratio is one plus the square root of five over two. And it happens throughout nature. It happens in Greek architecture. It happens in human anatomy. And it happens in many plants, such as the petals of a flower, arrangements of leaves on a stem, and an uncurling fern. 
Now, what's a fractal? A fractal is a dividing structure whereby every division is a mimicking pattern of the same shape, but at a different level. So where do we see fractals? We see fractals in snowflakes. We see fractals in the lung. We see fractals in trees. We see fractals in the blood vessels. So um, a fractal is a progressively dividing structure that each generation is the fractal generation. It is the same shape mimicking itself. So we talk about the bronchial tree. And when I'm describing the tree uh, to medical students or to uh, patients even, I'll sometimes say the stump or the trachea is like the stump of the tree. You get progressively narrowing, you get 25 generations of airways and you get out to these little balloon-like structures which are like the leaves in a tree. And this fractal distribution is very clever from a human perspective, from the lungs and from the interaction of the blood vessel it is a way of maximizing surface area for gas exchange to occur, for diffusion to occur. But it's also another thing that is throughout nature. And again, I'll mention just one of the guys that's in the WhatsApp group, Professor Didier Cernes. And in fact, if you're bored later this week, I would suggest looking up um, Professor Sarnet's uh, TED talk on predicting economic collapses and the importance of fractals in nature and how these can be applied to biological systems. And I'll mention a little project I did with Didier in that regard later. The last thing I was going to mention is the importance of bell curve. So at the start of COVID, essentially uh, the kind of takeoff or the slope of ascent is an exponential curve. And again, we were all thinking and hearing the term flatten the curve. And when you think of flatten the curve, you think of the speed of ascent, you think of the plateau, and you think of the speed of descent. And this actually happens throughout medicine a lot. You know, when we're thinking of when somebody is getting sick, we often go, what's the speed of climb of their white cells? What's the speed of climb of their neutrophils? What's the speed of climb of their C-reactive protein? What does a plateau have? Same goes for kidneys. So throughout medicine, we actually think a lot in terms of fractals, Fibonacci series, and bell curve. Now, what relevance is this to COVID? Um, I'll reflect back on a guy that I actually modeled my CF thesis on, and uh, it's Atul Gawande wrote an article called The Bell Curve in the New Yorker. And what he wrote about is the importance of uh, studying outliers and using that to benchmark yourself against the best. So back in the 1950s, there was one CF center in the world was getting a, a survival of two and a half years. And every other CF center or every other CF doctor in the world at the time was getting an average survival of two to three weeks. And they were kind of, they sent a team out, they kind of go, look, there's something wrong here. You're either not diagnosing the right condition or you're doing something wrong. Um, but it turned out that they just had a new way of treating cystic fibrosis. They were doing airway clearance. They were doing airway humidification. They were doing intense ways of improving digestion. And that is how the Cystic Fibrosis Association of America was founded. It was founded by studying outliers. So Atul Gawande, another brilliant article, well worth reading the, um, the bell curve in the New Yorker. Now, in terms of COVID, one of the things you can do is you can study outliers in COVID. You can study people that have a good response and do well with COVID. So why are some people doing well and some people doing very badly? And um, Liam showed us there earlier some of the innate immune factors that were affecting immunity. So in medicine, what you can do is you can take two outlier groups, you can age and gender match control them, and you can do what's called a genome-wide association study. And, and this has actually been published, I, I think it was in the New Yorker in the last few months, but they did a genome-wide association study on COVID looking for genetic modifiers that influenced good versus bad response. Um, and they actually found eight particular genes. So they found CC. R9, CXCR6, XCR1, FYC01. Now, a lot of these are meaningless letters, but uh, if you're looking for another interesting website, go to genecards.org, G-E-N-E-C-R-D-S.org, and you'll actually find out what most of these um, uh, genes do. 
But what you'll find is most of these are innate immune function genes and the variation in response in those that are getting bad clinical outcomes versus good clinical outcomes have got variations in their genetic response. And you'll be able to work out kind of that the different innate immune systems between thymocytes, uh, trafficking, ciliary function, uh, uh, phagocytosis are all, um, are all factors that came out in COVID there. Uh, and actually, interestingly, that um, that the, one of the ones that uh, Liam mentioned there, I think it's ORF6, uh, was one of the ones that came out as well, as well as the uh, blood group uh, loci came out as well. So factor A blood group or blood group A tends to do worse. Look, I'll, I'm going to just quickly change tack a little bit, and I'm just going to talk about some of the interesting things I learned from the COVID WhatsApp group. Uh, one guy in the group was a guy called Tomas Fuio. He wrote an article back in March 2020, and he's actually been helping uh, the Irish ISAG in the background with Sam Scarpino. Um, but Tomas Fuio wrote an article called The Hammer and the Dance, and he also gave a TED Talk back in 2018 talking about the importance of storytelling and making a story relevant, interesting, and finding things that people can associate with it. So in his Hammer and the Dance article, which has been shared with about 10 million people and translated into over 50 languages, uh, he basically described that you need to hammer down early and then you need to learn to dance and to suppress the uh, virus. And then he talked about how do you suppress it using a Swiss cheese model. And these are all the things that some of which we have done well and some of which we have done very poorly. The other interesting people in the group is, as I mentioned, uh, Professor Didier Sarnet. He is a professor of complex prediction modeling in Switzerland, and he does a TED talk on predicting economic collapses and also on how this branch of maths, which he has created called Dragon Kings, can be used to analyze uh, biological systems. And I mentioned certain things in medicine can be repetitive, you know, so all these things are uh, kind of overlap. So I contacted Didier about uh, five years ago when I was working in cystic fibrosis and doing my transplant fellowship. And I asked him, could we use his branch of Dragon Kings to predict who should get a transplant earlier in cystic fibrosis? And what his branch of mathematics studies is that the every event in a biological system is predetermined by a previous event. So in cystic fibrosis, the proximity to your last infection where you do further damage actually increase your time to your next chest infection. So there is incremental damage done with each infection such that further infections are more likely to happen earlier. And actually you can use this kind of prediction modeling to actually predict things earlier in biological systems. There's another guy uh, who does a kind of a, a online debate uh, against uh, Didier Sarnet, and it's a guy called Talib. Uh, and Talib uh, coined and studied what are called black swan events. Black swan events are seemingly sudden catastrophic events that are not interrelated with previous events. Now, getting back to what uh, Jerry Killeen asked earlier there is, is, what can we do as a nation? Pandemics are inevitable. We're experiencing a pandemic, it's going to be inevitable that we are going to get further um, pandemics. And what can we as a society do? One is we need to learn from this pandemic. We need to learn the mistakes we made. We need to invest in public health. Um, and I think medically, we were very good at managing COVID. We got expert advice. We got rapid sharing of information. Where we actually seem to fail is we seem to fail in the unification between public health, government response, and medical knowledge, because there's very little been uh, learned in the last year. I mean, New Zealand had the same information Ireland had. China had the same information Ireland had in terms of elimination versus suppression and the economic effects. So did Australia, so did Taiwan, so did Iceland. This kind of information was readily available and yet wasn't acted on, and that to me needs to be something we need to understand what were the mechanisms led to that not being acted on and what can we do in the future to improve that. One of the things I learned myself uh, during this year, and, and I know we've got Professor Carney speaking next, is 
that single individuals rarely alter a ship's course. Restrict, respected groups of uh, individuals working as an entity using evidence-based practice is what is often effective. Now, that can be done in two main ways. You can do it through a professional organization, uh, and, and that's what essentially ISAG is. It, it's a group of professionals and scientists advising. They're not doing it to cause controversy. They're not doing it to get elected. They're doing it for the greater good of society. So professional bodies are good at getting things. And one of the problems we've had in the last year is that We've had a lot of professional bodies. We've had business groups. We've had uh, the Vinters Association. We've had NEFIT. We've had ISAC. We've got a lot of groups with slightly different agendas. And then on top of that, we've got the government with their own agenda, which is to get reelected. And one of the difficulties with wanting to be reelected is you don't want to take responsibility for decisions and you tend to pawn it off on committees who are essentially protected. So we do have to learn how decisions are made. Um, last thing I suppose I just wanted to talk about is, is we have had positives come out of this pandemic. I mean, one of the things that uh, we experience a lot in healthcare is frustration at meeting barriers. And actually, if somebody has a vision and if somebody has a strategy and somebody can get in the room and break down the barriers and understand the significance of a barrier, things can get broken down pretty quickly. So one of the things that has been implemented at a low level, and it's definitely still a low level, is electronic prescribing in Ireland. I mean, we are very far behind in terms of Irish healthcare, in terms of electronic medical records, in terms of electronic prescribing, in terms of universal integration of health systems. I mean, we have become very siloed in our thinking on a national level. On our strategic planning on a national level, we have become exceptionally siloed. Um, I think that's essentially where I've got in terms of COVID. Um, so I think I've covered most of the points and I'll move it over to Adina for any questions. Thank you, Oshin. That was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And without further ado, I would love to invite Professor Patricia Kearney to present. Great. Thanks, Adina. No problem. Um, is that sharing now? Yeah. Great. Um, so this is my, uh, I love this image. Um, it's, it's full of joy and it's, um, I'm starting with it because it explains, I suppose, some of the motivation for some of the work that I've been involved with over the past year. Um, this is my niece, uh, Lucy Patricia O'Brien. Um, and this is her joy at seeing me on the television. Um, and I suppose uh, I'm conscious we've heard a lot about COVID's women's voices or the absence of women's voices. And so certainly part of the motivation for me in speaking um, is, is related to, to gender. And then it's also related um, to acknowledging uh, different perspectives. And we've already heard quite a bit um, this evening from Liam and Oshin in terms of the perspectives and how that has potentially influenced our response um, to, to the COVID-19. Um, COVID and I suppose I'm coming at from very much from a kind of a public health perspective. Um, and I thought it might be um, in a year where we've probably seen more and heard more of public health than I think most people um, have before. And um, it's, you know, tends to be the sort of what happens in the background and really you shouldn't hear about the work that we do because a lot of it's around prevention. Um, but I think it, I thought it might be worth reminding people what, what public health is and what it's about. Um, um, and so one the, and apologies one of its students and then maybe it's giving definitions uh, is a bit is a bit basic. Um, but I quite like this one from Atchison, which is about the art and science of preventing disease, prolonging life, and promoting health through the organized efforts of society. And that's the piece that I really wanted to emphasize because we frequently, we have a television here in front of us uh, now. You know, we're seeing people talking about public health, but frequently they're talking about individual and personal responsibility. Um, and I think it's really important to emphasize that public health is really about societal responsibility. Um, so what I thought I'd talk a little bit about this evening um, uh, is how, and we've heard a lot, uh, you know, uh, lots of people are sitting in armchairs around the world um, and have become armchair epidemiologists. So over the past year, 
I've uh, started to take baby steps towards being an advocate. And um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about what has influenced me um, to make those decisions. But I thought I would start with epidemiology because certainly up until a, a year ago, a lot of people didn't know what epidemiology was. I've certainly been asked if I was a skin doctor. And um, usually when I'm explaining um, to, to, to someone what I am, the, the, my work is as an epidemiologist, I, I talk about things, of course, now I could talk about COVID in the past was about these uh, older films, contagion and outbreak. And I would always say, but I don't do that. I do that for chronic disease. Um, and certainly early on in the pandemic, I had been quite reluctant to speak about this because I was very conscious that I am a chronic disease epidemiologist and most of my um, training and experience has been in that area. But <laughs> as I, my, one of my sisters said to me, she said, but you are an epidemiologist. Um, but again, and apologies for another definition, but I think it's helpful at a time when we're all looking at data and becoming very good at looking at data to think about why we are very careful um, in epidemiology in terms of how we describe it. And so we're interested in the distribution and determinants of health-related states and uh, in, in populations and then applying that to prevent and control health problems. But the thing I think that's really important to emphasize is that it's both the distribution and the determinants. And it's really trying to understand and unpick what's going on behind the data. Um, and so uh, this is a slide that I've used for many, many years, and uh, it dates me a little bit because I used it at a time when um, the X-Files, when I started teaching first, the X-Files were really popular. And then there was about a decade when nobody knew what it meant. And then I found that the medical students would all look kind of engaged because the reruns had become popular. And now I think it's gone out of, <laughs> out of popularity again. But uh, any of you who have uh, some time to spare, I'm sure you'll find old episodes of, of the X-Files somewhere. Um, but, you know, the two, two of the things I suppose that have informed me and informed my work is the idea that there is a truth um, out there somewhere that we're looking for. Um, sorry, I've managed to make my image disappear. Um, uh, and so we need to unpick that information and try and figure out what's going on. And then we've already heard from, from both Liam and Oshin mentioned perspective, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and so the perspective that really informs my thinking is, is very much this kind of population health perspective. Um, and so uh, Oshin talked about the, the bell-shaped curve, and I suppose in, in clinical medicine and, you know, in, in thinking about COVID, we're often thinking about the extremes of that curve, which are really very important. Um, but in public health, we're really also very interested in that, that big part. And for example, more, more average risk people die of preventable disease than high risk, because there's just way more average risk. That, that bell, that big uh, piece in the middle, there's a lot of people in there. And it's very important that we think about that um, when we're responding to these types of health threats. Um, so this is, and I just included this at the last minute, so apologies that the font is tiny, um, but I was just wanted to reflect on a comment that Adina made in her intro around the role and responsibility of third level students. And it speaks back to my comment about responsibility. And this was some uh, research work that I did. And Ivan, was the, Ivan Perry, the head of the School of Public Health was the lead on this. It was funded through one of the HRB rapid response and we looked, it was a survey, we had multiple waves where we asked people about their behaviors um, during COVID-19. And this was during the different waves, this is kind of year old data now, and um, looking at the different restrictions and the levels of adherence. And the message I just wanted to, to, to share here was, and I've um, just circled it in red there, was the very high levels of adherence with the uh, restrictions that were, were, were reported by third level students. And to me, what was really interesting when we took this work, and it goes back to that personal and political responsibility, is that, you know, most people are following the rules. Most of us are staying within our 5K, um, and the solution is not uh, to remind us of the need uh, to do that. The solution lies elsewhere. So where are we at? Um, many of you will be aware of this. So there's a link there to the HPSC, the Health Protection Surveillance Centre. Um, I'm an epidemiologist, so I couldn't give a talk without showing some data, uh, maps and graphs. Um, and, you know, there's low, what's really nice now is there is lots of data out there that you can uh, play around with. And um, looking at the data, I suppose what is 
good is that we're seeing that the, the number of cases um, is starting to drop. As we heard, uh, Cork and Kerry actually are doing particularly well. Um, and it does, I think certainly as um, someone living in Cork and Kerry with children who will be returning hopefully to school, um, you know, we need to think about a zoning approach. Um, and if there is a place that's safer or safest at the moment, um, it's probably local to us. But looking, just pulling out one of those graphs, which is one of the cases, uh, the number of cases. So this is just literally the number of cases um, per day plotted uh, on a graph. And I suppose what's extraordinary, and I, this maybe echoes a little bit one of the questions that came in, which is, you know, why are we here? So a year ago, we knew nothing about this disease. We didn't know how to control it. Um, and yet we did manage to, to, to relatively bring the, 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 the pandemic under control. And yet we faced another, we faced another two uh, sur surges and we're potentially going to face at least another one this year. Um, and going back to this idea of, you know, what an epidemiologist does and what we're interested in, which is kind of understanding what's going on behind the data. And I think this was alluded to in terms of the um, uh, testing of cases, the numbers only tell you, so, you know, this graph that I showed, that's assuming that we're actually capturing the cases that are out there. But what this graph doesn't tell you is that the actual criteria to be able to access a test, uh, to be able to order a test, changed quite dramatically. Um, and so early on in the pandemic, in order to be eligible to get a test, you essentially had to be a close contact or have traveled um, from an area of concern. And so we only had local transmission because you could only get a test um, if you, you know, sort of met those criteria. Um, and so what people knew on the ground and these group of clinicians um, went ahead and tested um, against the, the, um, the national guidance at that time. And indeed they found that there was already evidence of community transmission. And that's something that I'm going to um, come back to. Um, but it's sort of, that I remember, I suppose, back a year ago when I was seconded to HSE South um, and asking, you know, why, why do we keep saying that we don't have community transmission? Because we're not testing for community transmission. Um, and so then over the summer, I got involved and we've heard already a little bit about this um, with the Independent Scientific Advocacy Group. And um, as Oshin mentioned, we're really we're just trying to see if there's a better way to do this and look around and you know you look at that graph and we're not getting we're it's a year later and we're not getting better as a country you know certainly the the disease is being managed better in the hospital and um, you know there's been a lot of progress there vaccines are developed that's all really good news but as a country in terms of how we're managing this at a population level there's certainly things that could be done better and so i need to acknowledge one of my eyesight colleagues uh, Paul Dempsey is a mathematical scientist who prepares these graphs and he presents uh, a weekly update um, at our weekly webinars and he presents we're very much an all island group um, and so he presents data from the north and from the republic and so this is a graph of data from uh, northern Ireland <clears throat> so you can see it goes back there until October and certainly um, reassuring um, uh, patterns in terms of the data there the different lines give you the different age groups um, and you can see that the, the numbers are dropping uh, in the north. Um, in the Republic, um, and here again, we're going back as far as October, you can see some of those things uh, written in, in terms of what was changing. We have the introduction of level five, the numbers coming down. And um, this is stratified not by age, but by healthcare workers and non-healthcare workers. And so certainly, um, uh, you know, a suggestion there that, uh, you know, really that it is having an impact and um, some concern in terms of the non-healthcare workers that you're seeing this uptick. It's early days yet and we'll have another week of data um, tomorrow and Paul will be updating the numbers then. Um, but certainly of concern with the new variant and um, that even level five um, may not be suppressing things enough. Um, and so this is by age group. Um, one of the things I should mention, of course, here is that, um, you know, these are numbers. And of course, the other, the big thing that did change relatively recently was the, the when we were doing the contact tracing and then um, uh, testing of close contacts, which was stopped for a while. And um, so that may have distorted some of these numbers as well. 
So uh, if we look at this at a bit of more granular level, we can try and figure out what might be going on locally. And um, so this is in Dublin. Um, and you can see here that the numbers do um, appear to be uh, or are definitely um, uh, coming up. Um, and whether that's the role of the, the, the new variants, and I'm going to uh, touch on that again. And um, some good news for those of you who are based um, in Cork and Kerry, we can see that really um, the pattern of transmission is quite different. Um, and if there was ever a time for a, a, an independent Republic of Cork, it's uh, probably around now. So I, I, I mentioned that I was going to loop back a little bit around um, that idea of whether we had local transmission or community transmission and when, you know, the fact that we did have community transmission before it was more widely recognized. And um, we had a headline on Friday, there's three cases, um, and I'm using this language because it's what was used in the RTE report, but I, my preference is not to use the name of a country with a particular variant, because of course that's just where it was identified. Um, uh, so the Department of Health said three cases of COVID-19 first identified in Brazil were confirmed in Ireland for the first time. Uh, the department said all of the cases of the P1 variant are directly associated with recent travel from Brazil and cases are appropriately being followed up. Um, and, you know, the, um, the deputy CMO uh, reminded um, that people arriving from various countries need to, um, and are in fact are now required by law, to quarantine at home for 14 days. Um, and certainly I was struck by the coverage of some of this news around um, that this was reassuring that the three cases that had been identified um, were all from a variant of a country that had been identified as a, a, a variant of concern. And it reminded me a little bit of this um, excuse me, blog on the Cochrane website that um, you can read in detail there by a, a GP fellow. And this aphorism, um, the origin of which is uh, uh, unclear, but uh, this idea that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Um, and importantly, and one of the things I've been trying to figure out is who are we testing? And so we definitely are testing um, people who are coming from variant of concern countries who present and who are um, uh, in whom COVID is detected. Um, they then go under the appropriate um, analyses to see if the variant of concern is present. But it's unclear whether there is other large scale uh, screening going on to detect the variant. Um, and so what's the alternative? Um, and this is an image um, from Australia there, and we've heard this from Oshie, and you know, other countries are doing things differently. Um, and so in Australia, they have mandatory quarantine that's implemented at the airport. And it's not simply, as is the case in Ireland at the moment, okay, it's a legal requirement, but people are just told that it's a legal requirement. Um, and going back to this idea of kind of societal responsibility and organized efforts of society. So, you know, this, this requires a lot of work uh, for sure, um, but we can also think about the potential benefits. Um, and so I was really convinced uh, around this. Um, I mentioned ISAG, we have a website, there's lots of webinars there, including one by Dr. Niall Conroy, who is um, an Irish doctor and works now as a consultant in public health medicine in Australia. And he very generously gave us a webinar, really just talking through the logistics, the practicalities, you know, it's um, Elimination is not, it's not magic. You know, if the government decide tomorrow that we're going for, for, for elimination, um, there's going to be a huge amount of work, difficult decisions uh, to try and implement that. Um, but it is a choice. Um, and uh, it's certainly one I think that should at least be considered. Um, so that's a little bit about my journey to advocacy. Um, as an academic, one of the things that I was doing when I um, when I was going to start talking about this was thinking about well you know what is what's the evidence you know what what should I and should not be doing um, and I suppose one of the things that has uh, struck me was this last point which was to reflect continuously you know why am I doing this um, and it goes back to where I started which was um, with my niece and um, who I hadn't uh, uh, scene. So I live quite close to her. So I have actually seen her because I've walked past her house 
Um, but, you know, uh, Liam was talking about the lives that we want to live um, and, you know, we can do better than this um, and we can do it um, through our organised efforts. Um, and, uh, you know, it struck me, uh, I went to, I had the opportunity to speak at the um, Iraqta Special Committee on COVID-19 during the summer with Anthony Staines. And that was back in August. And I was, there was sort of three points that I wanted to make, um, which was that COVID was a serious and, and scary disease at that day. And um, the same day, the meat plant um, were also presenting information. And, you know, there was a lot of fear really there. Um, we, but importantly, we know that we can stop the virus. And the third really important point that I was trying to make at that time and continue to, to try to make um, is that we need clear and decisive action. Um, and I think that's really what we've been advocating for um, in, in ISAG over the past year. Um, so I don't know if this will work or not. Uh, I'm, I know I'm conscious of time. Um, it's going to work. This is, I think it's only a minute and a half. Um, so this is from, uh, we've expanded uh, and have a group now called We Can Be Zero. Am I allowed to do this? I'm so sorry. I don't mean to interrupt you. I don't think the video is showing for us. Oh, okay. Uh, so that's okay. Uh, the link will be there. And if any of you want to watch it, um, it's, uh, um, I suppose just a whole other area in terms of the advocacy. One of the things is that, um, so in the Independent Scientific Advocacy Group, we are a group of scientists and um, you've all heard the comment, you know, that it's like, and so we spend a lot of time um, uh, discussing things. And so it's been great to get people who are actually advocates uh, uh, in trying to figure out how I can stop YouTube now. Can you... Uh, so I, do, I think I just, I, the only slide I had left was um, just an acknowledgement of my colleagues uh, in ISAG, Paul Dempsey, who did the slides, um, and the We Can Be Zero group. So thank you. Thank you for that, Patricia. That was absolutely brilliant. And thank you for that wonderful insight into the important role of public health 